Welcome everyone to Communal Places and Neglected Spaces, Exploring Indiana's Roadside Springs. We're here tonight with folklorist Kay Westhues, who will discuss the phenomenon of roadside natural springs still used for drinking water by the public today in Indiana. Kay will share her research, including snippets of interviews from her recent oral history project. Um, I'd like everybody to please remain muted during the uh, presentation so that we get a nice recording um, and everybody can hear clearly. Um, but I really welcome you all and I'm so glad you all are here. And Kay, if you'd like to take it away. I'll Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Here. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you, Diane. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to get started. Uh, PowerPoint. I'm going to do a PowerPoint with you all. But for, I wanted to thank the Jefferson County of Public Library and Diane for providing me this opportunity. I'm already, am I screen sharing? Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Move my Zoom out of the way and, and I can get started. All right, so what I'm going to do today is share a bit about the history of some roadside springs that I've researched in Indiana, and I'm going to explore a couple questions like how some of them remain in the public commons, why some remain and some kind of go out of our collective memory. And so I'm going to just uh, take you on sort of a road trip because we're going to explore a number of different springs across the state and talk about their, their history, briefly their history. So first, I would just like to talk a little bit about what a spring is, because that definition a lot of times is missing from my talks, I realize, and I'd like to talk about that. I, I use a, a number of terms in my presentation, artesian well, flowing well, gravity-fed spring, and those are all different types of springs. A spring is just basically where water from the ground, groundwater, comes to the surface um, of the earth, and there are different types of springs. Uh, there's a seep, which is where the water just gradually comes up to the earth, like sort of in a bog or something like that. An artesian well, which we're seeing there on the left side, is a special kind of spring, and it's where um, there's a kind of a confined aquifer. It's got like a rock or clay that's holding the water um, confined, and then there's an opening in that rock or clay where the water is kind of forced out through geology and it's, it flows without need for a pump. So when we're looking at this spring here, it's flowing quite you know, forcefully, but there's no pump there. It's coming right out of the earth like that. And artesian wells can be somewhat destructive sometimes because a person might accidentally make one when they're drilling, for example, for a well, and then it could flood their yard. So an artesian well can be a good and a bad thing. It can also occur just naturally. This one here, um, I believe, was uh, um, an accident, but it was an accident that now is used by the whole community. Um, so it's pretty cool. A gravity-fed spring is one that just flows down like a mountain or a rock face. And this uh, gravity-fed spring is in Newark, Indiana, which is near, um, I think it's in Greene County near Bedford. Um, you can see that there's a small pipe on the top right of that rock face. So a gravity fed spring could also be piped just like an artesian well can. Both of them can be piped so that you can access the water easier. Next one. Um, okay, so one thing I wanted to ask is just if anyone has ever drank water directly from a spring and you can just um, either put it in the chat or raise your hand. I'm just kind of curious if anyone has had water directly from a spring. Or if you haven't, if you've ever seen anyone collect water from a spring. Okay, so um, I see some, I don't think so. So yeah, it's, it's uh, getting to be a rarer thing than it used to be. There are um, still a lot of places, depending on what state you're in, there are more or less um, public springs. But in Indiana, it's a bit rarer than it used to be. Um, it used to be like in the late 19th century, there were hundreds of springs, roadside springs or what they call public springs in the state. 
Um, and before we had municipal water systems, they were used as water supplies, um, individuals or town water supplies. And there, of course, were different types of public springs. This one is Trinity Springs. It's a sulfur water spring in Martin County, Indiana. And it was considered to have a curative effect, uh, good for your health, and it was a site of a spa, so or you know, in a hotel and a spa. So um, there were several springs that were the sites of spas because they were considered to have health effects, good for good health effects. There are other springs that were just kind of parks, basically. So that the one on the top in Glen Miller Park, it still exists today in Richmond, Indiana. It's a beautiful spring um, in Glen Miller Park. And it was uh, sort of a picnic area, a place that people, you know, spent their holidays um, and you could go get fresh water. There were also roadside springs in the bottom left, Lakeview Spring is a roadside spring where people would just drive by when they were traveling and get water. Because in 1955, you didn't really go to 7-Eleven and get a bottle, right? You had to get your, you had to bring your drinks with you. And a lot of times people stopped at springs and filled up and got a, a drink there. So there are these different types of springs. Also during this time, like in the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, spring water was bottled. And so it, it was either bottled for its health um, aspects or bottled because there was an issue with you know, pure water in a region. So on the right, we see Black Oak spring water, which was bottled and sold in Hammond, Indiana. Um, Black Oak is actually now part of Gary, Indiana, but it was bottled and sold as a alternative to um, bad uh, private wells. So yeah, there's definitely some bottled water all the way back then. Um, but today there are very few public springs left in Indiana. And this is a map that I kind of mashed up together. It's a bed rock, it shows the bed rock aquifer systems in Indiana, of which there are many. And then I added the dots to indicate the springs that I've been able to research. So you can see that they do kind of span the length and width of the state. Um, but there is only about uh, right now 46 to date that I've found um, that are still used or were once used for drinking water. Now the aquifer systems that you see here, they're defined by the rock type. So each aquifer system is kind of named after the type of rock that holds the water. And that affects what's in the water because water contains traces of the surfaces that it flows through. So if a rock has limestone, it's going to pick up some of that mineral, or if it goes through shale, it's gonna pick up some of that mineral. So that can um, change the quality of the water in different, that's coming from different aquifers. You can see that Jeffersonville kind of has a mixture of uh, aquifers down here. It's not just one, there's like a few that kind of make up that area. So of the 46 that I've been researching, I've documented 26 that are official public springs. And that means they are in parks or public areas and they're officially open to the public. They're tested on a regular basis. And the one we're looking at here is in Carmel, Indiana. And just a little north of Indianapolis on 116th Street. It's actually Carmel's first public park. And it not only has this great source of water, which is very popular. Every time I've been there, I've never been there even in the middle of winter when there hasn't been people getting water from that spring. But it also has a really nice trail system and Pool Creek runs behind it, which you can see is kind of a recreation area. It's a really nice relaxed area. I mean, if you're ever traveling through Indy, it's a nice place to stop, uh, eat your lunch or whatever. But that's an example of a public spring. And that spring is tested and the test results are put on the park's website. So you can always see the, you know, how clean that water is. Um, this is another public spring that's in Pittsburgh, which is near um, Delphi. Pittsburgh is a very small community. We're almost looking at the whole town right here in this one image. Um, it's basically a crossroad, but the spring is there and it doesn't look like a park, but it's a very well-loved spring. It was actually moved there because it was closer to a highway. And when they built an overpass, they were going to take out the spring and the community rallied around and got it repiped and moved to this location here. So it is also very highly visited spring. Um, and it's uh, weekly tested. And you can see that the test results are posted right at the spring site. Nitrate levels are primarily what they're um, testing for. And that way, if there is a high nitrate level, people can um, 
decide whether they want to get that water that week or not. So that's one solution and one way that they um, are keeping this spring open. Now, there are other types of springs that I found that are not really so-called public springs. They're on private property and they're just accessed, you know, by the area residents. And these springs are considered vestiges of what's called the agricultural public commons. And that's a term that has roots in 17th century Europe. Um, so at that time, land held in common was privately owned. So there would be like a wealthy landowner, but they would make the common land available to local families so that they could grow food or graze their livestock or collect wood, basically so they could sustain themselves because they didn't have property. So uh, this kind of continued in the States. During my research, I also researched springs in Kentucky, and I learned that public access to a spring was sometimes written into a deed of sale. So the deed of sale would say, the spring has to be made available to the public you know, in, in perpetuity. I just visited a spring in South Carolina, which was actually donated to God. So there are like really some serious um, you know, considerations for the people who get that water. When you go to a privately owned spring, it's hard to tell whether that, that water is tested or not. So um, I would definitely either boil or filter it or talk to the landowner to find out whether those springs are actually tested. Now the last kind of group of springs that I found are ones that used to run but no longer run. So this is one in Jimerson Lake, which is up near Angola in the northeast part of the state. And you can see that the water is barely coming out of that pipe. And actually, since I've taken this picture, it has dried up altogether. Um, I, I don't know if it's coming back or not, but it used to be, a, a, again, a very well-known spring. But sometimes what happens is there is some development in the area, and it changes the way that the artesian well works. It doesn't have that same pressure anymore. Some other reasons that springs might um, stop being in use is contamination. So maybe agricultural runoff. And we can see in this spring, there's a lot of algae in it. If a spring is located next to a pasture, if it's located next to a road that's highly trafficked, it has a lot of traffic, all those things can cause the owners, the landowners to cap the wells and make them not available anymore. Um, sometimes just a change in land ownership. So someone doesn't want the liability of the spring anymore. So there are a lot of reasons why springs kind of go out of use. Um, but besides this, it's still gathering water from a spring is a practice that many people find relevant and fulfilling. And I don't know if anyone's, has anyone ever visited this site, findaspring.com? It's a website that is kind of a database for springs all over the world. I don't know if anyone's visited this spring. It helped me in my research quite a bit getting started. And if you look at this image, there's a lot of symbolism in it. <coughs> Excuse me. The image on their homepage. It really, I don't know, what kind of symbolism do you see happening in this? Right? I've got a little drink of water problem here. Thanks to many guys. It is a very cool site. You can upload the springs, any springs that you want to share here. <clears throat> but when I look at this image, I see a very romanticized view of nature um, that I think is very close to how people feel about springs. <clears throat> I think there's also a suggestion of spirit, a spirituality in this image. And also, this idea, this Western myth of, you know, exploration, going out and finding something in nature. I see all of that in just this one image. So spring sites can be quite meaningful to those who experience them. I found through interviewing people and through studying folklore, and not simply for the practical reasons, but because of the thoughts that springs inspire. We've all heard this idea, you know, water is life, water sustains life. And that gives it a cultural and symbolic power that's expressed in centuries of water folk folklore. There is a lot of folklore about water out there. It's considered to be sacred. It can be considered to have healing properties, to be lucky, to bring luck. 
water demonstrates the power and agency of a natural world, um, it can be very destructive. It can create new landforms. <clears throat> and on an intimate level, water is moving through all of our cells right now at this moment. So we experience water at an intimate level all the time. We're just not aware of it. <laughs> Springs themselves have a distinct significance in water folklore. This is a holy well in Ireland that I visited in 2011. And holy wells are special springs. They predate Christianity. They're considered to have healing properties. Um, they're usually devoted to specific saints that were um, pagan saints before um, Christianity. Um, they're also a place of prayer and petition. So springs have been considered kind of a bridge between like the upper and the lower worlds. They suggest how the human spirit moves through material domains, you know, the upper and lower world. Um, these springs here are St. Bridget's Well. There are many St. Bridget's Well. I think there's approximately 15 in Ireland. There was more than one St. Bridget, but specific wells will have like associated specific healing um, capabilities. So one might be good for the skin, one might be good for the eyes. They're considered a place of, of spiritual resource. So they're very powerful in a symbolic way. Now, in my research here locally, I've learned that there's a lot of reasons why people go to the trouble of getting water from a spring. You know, you could just turn on the tap at home. Why would you go visit a spring or gather water there? Well, many people just simply like to get a drink when they pass a spring that they are that they that they know about. Sometimes they've shared that activity with family members and friends growing up. Now, this is Flooring Well Park again, and there's really a community of spring uh, of, of water gatherers that form at the park. Like these two folks came separately, but they knew each other and had a lot to talk about while they were there. Sometimes people share um, ideas about how to transport, store, filter the water. There are also a, a large number, I think a growing number of people that collect spring water for health reasons. And one of the concerns, of, of course, you've probably heard of fluoride in water, people are concerned about that. But they're also concerned about un unregulated chemicals like perfluorinated compounds, which are called PFOAs. They're a byproduct of Teflon and herbicides in the water, such as metolacular, metolacular. And both of those chemicals have been linked to cancer, but they're currently not tracked in our public water system. So people are concerned about that. They're turning to the springs to get their water. There are also water gatherers who only use glass water bottles because they want to reduce the amount of microplastics they ingest. And so they don't even want to use plastic for gathering the water. So health reasons is a big, is a big motivation for people who get water from springs. It's also collected for spiritual reasons. So as we, we can see here on the left, Kendra and Ray, I met them at the Kramer Spring, which is um, down near Attica, Indiana. And they collect spring water to create crystal infused water, which they use in Wicca practices. So they have to visit a spring to get that water. Um, otherwise the, the practice wouldn't be um, wouldn't work. Uh, they're also the use of municipal water system could violate religious beliefs about the use of modern technology. So some people just prefer to gather that spring water for that reason. And lastly, there are people who depend on springs as their primary water source. These are individuals who spend a lot of time loading the backs of trucks and hatchbacks with water that they will use out of necessity. And this could be caused by having maybe a private well that goes bad or having water shut off at your home or having a natural disaster, um, frozen pipes, lots of things can result in a dependence on the outside water source. So I'm gonna talk about two springs in a bit more detail. And the first one I wanna talk about is a spring in Independence, Indiana. And uh, just to talk about the significance of springs as I guess a, a site of conflict over territory and access. So public springs, as I said before, they're considered a part of the public commons, but that doesn't mean they're not claimed as private property. They were, if you look at um, maps of springs in, in different states, you'll see that springs were often named after the property owners. 
and they are central to claims that colonizers made on the land. They, to control a spring is to control you know, a source of water. So they were significant um, to that. So looking at this map of independence in 1877, maybe 1877, you can see that there's a spring marked on it called a fine spring. Does everyone see that uh, red circle around it? It was noted, it was such a good spring that it was actually noted on this map. But approximately 40 years prior to that map, um, over 850 Potawatomi were forced by gunpoint you know, to leave their homeland in Indiana, walked approximately 660 miles to the state of Kansas. So that's been referred to in, in, as the trail of, death, trail of Death because approximately 42 people died along the way. It was a forced removal that caused a lot of heartache and changed the trajectory of our history of our state you know, permanently. Um, so after that trail of death happened, the village of independence was plotted five years later by Zachariah Seacup. He was a local trader who supported the U.S. interest in Tecumseh's war in the War of 1812. And Seacup was, allowed, was allotted 3,000 acres for that service, which included that spring. So he was actually awarded the spring. And that was the beginning of the town of independence. So when I visited Independence Spring, it was also known as Potawatomi Spring. I visited it in 2010, and I thought the property looked kind of neglected. I mean, it had a trash can there. It didn't have a lot of trash, but it just looked like it wasn't maintained very well. And I assumed that the spring was no longer used as a water supply. But then when I got to talking, because what I love to do is oral history, so I got to talking with some of the area residents and I learned that for decades, it was the primary source of drinking water for the whole village of Independence. And I talked with an 85-year-old resident, and he shared some childhood memories of making weekly trips to the spring to gather wash water. They used a 55-gallon barrel strapped to the headlights of his family's car. In the 1960s, he helped lay the tile and section lines to bring that water right into people's homes. He told me that it was difficult to dig private wells in Independence because they were sitting over a very thick layer of shale. Now that's probably what protected and helped keep this spring so pure, but they couldn't dig wells because of it. So when I talked with him in 2010, he told me several houses near the spring were still drawing water from that, from that spring. Well, I revisited it in 2021 and talked to the next door, the house right to the right of this picture. There's a home right to the right of this photo. And the resident there told me his water supply still came from the spring. And he thought there was only one other household that still used the spring for the water supply, but it was still in use. So I thought that was very interesting. And it does look like it's been a bit better maintained when I visited the second time. And it's a very beautiful place. I recommend going there if you're ever in that area. So the last spring I'm going to talk about is one that I've spent a lot of time with over the past few years. It's the Chase Street Spring in Gary, Indiana. It's also referred to as the Spring at Small Farms. And this is a map of where the spring is. You can see that Indiana University Northwest is pretty close to the spring. Um, and it's also close to the Little Calumet River, just south of the Little Calumet River on Chase Street. Um, for three decades, from the 50s through the 70s, 1950s through the 70s, it supplied drinking water to residents in the communities of Black Oak and Small Farms. Black Oak, you can see on the map. If you look directly right up to Black Oak and you see that little circle, that was the center of Small Farms. Small Farms no longer, it actually was never formally recognized by the post office, but it no longer exists as a, as a community. It's, it's um, over the years lost its residents due to a number of different reasons. But during the 50s and 70s, those two rural neighborhoods didn't have municipal services and they relied on private wells, which were very shallow and were easily contaminated. And then during the 70s and 80s, there was a um, huge dump that was right between 94 and 25th Avenue, that blank space that you see above the circle. That's now an EPA Superfund site. So the artesian that which polluted a number of wells. So the artesian well drew from a different aquifer and it wasn't effect, affected by the Superfund site and it remained drinkable and pure water. It's sort of a little miracle. So small farms um, 
was historically uh, settled by African Americans who, who came there during the Great Migration and searched for better jobs and opportunities in the North. Black Oak was primarily a white community who also uh, of, of rural people who settled there uh, for a similar reason, you know, for better jobs and better opportunities. Um, but due to racially restrictive housing governments and fraudulent lawn land sales, small farms was located in the floodplain near the Little Calumet River. And it, it never really took off as a, 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 a town in, or a community in itself. But despite the challenges of racial segregation and the denial of capital, that community persisted. The residents built houses, they had kept farms, and they worked in mills and other businesses um, until, like I said, the 80s is when it started to sort of um, disperse. So I didn't know all this when I first visited the spring in 2010. But when I first visited it, I learned about it from someone who was actually at a different spring who told me there was a spring in Gary I should visit. So I came to visit it and I could tell it was still in use in part because of that pallet. Usually there's some type of surface placed under the water so that people can collect it easy, you know, put their jugs under there. Sometimes you'll see discarded water jugs at the site. So I knew that the spring was still in use even though I didn't meet anybody there. But one of my primary research questions is always, you know, how and why do springs remain in the public commons? So to answer that question, I needed to talk with the people who used it so in 2019, I started an oral history project with the help of Indiana Humanities and a Calumet Heritage Partnership, also Center for Sustainable Future at IU South Bend, Women at IU South Bend and St. Mary's College at Notre Dame. They all um, supported this project. I ended up interviewing 21 people who either used the spring in the past or currently used it. Um, and all my interviewees were Gary residents or former Gary residents. 61% identified as female, 80 were over 50. A few folks had not had just tasted the water but weren't like um, regular users. So these are just a few of the folks who shared their stories and memories um, with me for this project. So the archive is now housed at IUSB Special Collections and they created an online exhibit for it and I'm going to show that page right now so you guys can see what that looks like this is the site um, that contains all of the interviews and photos that we collected during this project um, the home page is this is the home page of the project there's a map here and then the interviews are organized by the narrators by the people who shared their stories or by the topic so there's different topics that you can explore to learn about aspects of the water um, there's also a photo gallery and bibliography there. Met several photo, uh, photo galleries. But I thought I would just share a few of the interviews uh, snippets. They're just very short snippets so that you can hear a little bit about um, the stories that were shared. I'm going to share one by Betty Erlene Jordan, who, uh, with her family, they collected water um, when she was a kid. She always um, was tasked with cleaning the glass milk jugs that they used to collect it at the time. So I'm going to go ahead. I hope you can hear this. I'm going to go ahead and play this um, short interview. It was just nice, clean, cold water. It was always very cold, and it's all I ever knew mm -hmm. growing up. I didn't know anything other than that. I didn't know that everybody didn't go to the well um, when I was a kid because there were always a lot of people there. You'd go, you'd have to wait your turn before you, you know, go down a little hill and get your water. And there was always somebody else waiting to go after you finished. So it, it was, I've learned from several people that it was sort of a social spot. I'm going to share, can, I hope that you guys can hear that okay. Could you hear that interview okay? just want to make sure. So I'm going to go ahead and play... Uh, one more short one, good here. Chuck Hughes, who uh, now is executive director of the Gary Chamber of Commerce, he grew up in the, the small farms neighborhood and just talks about how it was a treat for him when he was a kid. I think spring water for, the, for, for me and, and, and my cousins, my brothers and sisters, if we wouldn't got it, it was, it was a luxury. It's like today when people, people drink Perrier instead of uh, right. regular water. We was going, hey, let's go get spring water. So we went. And, Went through the weeds and found the spring water. Yeah. 
So there, there's some terrific um, stories about springs and the use of springs. There's also another artesian well uh, in Gary called the Black Oak Spring, which there's a little bit of history about that spring here as well. So if you have time and would like to visit it, it's, it's a fun site. I think there's a lot of content there. I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint now and just talk a bit more about the Gary Spring. Let's get this up, here we go. Okay, so um, this is a image from 1966 that came from the Gary Post Tribune. And that year, um, small farms had an estimated 5,000 people, but they still didn't have municipal water and um, sewer lines or, or public water. So that year, approximately 80 people picketed the Gary City Hall and the Gary offices of the Gary Hobart Water Cor Corporation. And they demand an extension of water services into small farms in Black Oak. And there were a lot of promises at the time to bring water lines in. But despite that, both communities waited another 20 years for a lot of uh, various reasons, which some are explained on the site. Um, for, they waited another 20 years for public water lines. And so it was a long struggle to get public water into those two communities. Um, so when I first visited the spring, as I said before, in 2010, the number of people using that spring had markedly decreased. I mean, there, was not, there wasn't that many people that I would find using it, but it mo mostly it was a neglected space. The city of Gary closed Chase Street because it was built over a marsh and it had deteriorated and became unsafe to drive on. So this Chase Street became a dead end road that was a destination for illegal dumpers which is a problematic issue in Gary because it's been difficult to address that because of their lack of tax base and you know, drop, of pop drop of population, although they're doing a really good job at the moment. Um, and there have been, since I learned about the spring in 2010, cleanups that have happened at the spring, the dumping just kept persisting. So in 2019, as part of this oral history project, I met members of the Gary Food Council. Um, Alba Mohammed, who's the president, she's not pictured here, but um, a number of, um, of us went to visit the spring. Gary Food Council is a nonprofit and their mission is to address food security issues in Gary. And they took the restoration of the spring site as one of their campaigns. And they began reaching out to the Little Calumet River Development Commission. They're the organization or the, the nonprofit who owns the property that contains the spring. They're in charge of all the flood control along the Little Calumet to the Illinois border. And um, so they, they wanted to, they asked the Little Cal Commission to clean up the spring, to do more frequent testing. At that time, they were testing on a monthly basis. They wanted a weekly test. Um, they wanted to make it safer to access. Um, so, they ended up organizing a cleanup in 2021, a Martin Luther King Day cleanup. And it was very, very cold. It was zero degrees, close to zero degrees. And they still had at least, I counted 35 people come. Um, they, they, had, they served a the breakfast, they cleaned up the spring, they did a great job. And that day the commission announced plans for a spring park. So this has been the best outcome of this project that I could have asked for. Um, they allocated some money to, and they uh, accepted a proposal to develop a park for the spring. Um, they did the groundbreaking in June 2022, and you can see on the right, what they're planning to do is to make a cul-de-sac so that people can kind of drive in, get their water, and drive back out. Right now, it's a little hazardous to get there because you have to walk down, especially in the winter, you have to walk down a little hill to get to the spring. So they're going to make it... Um, safer to use, they're gonna add some parking and lighting and up, update the piping of the spring. So that's been a great outcome. So just to summarize, you know, springs play an essential role in fostering life, in particular human habitation. And the well's continuous flow quietly affirms this history and the people who gather water there are enjoying their rights to these vestiges of the public commons, often without any knowledge of that legacy. So knowing and acknowledging the origin of a water source, whether it is a spring or it's a lake, an aquifer, a river, that's the first step in protecting it for future generations. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. Um, I really hope if you have any questions, um, I'd be glad to take questions. 
and um, anything that you would like to. I'm going to go ahead and stop. Should I keep sharing in case someone wants to see something, or should I stop sharing at this point? I think you should probably continue sharing. That's fine. Okay. okay. Thanks, Diane. Does anyone have any questions? You can unmute or you can put them in the chat. Thank you, Lisa. It was it was really fascinating, I'm, and and I am just very very interested in this and and i didn't know anything about the topic before you uh before i started in uh, corresponding with you um and i wanted to ask i noticed a spring that looked like it had to be very close to knox county indiana let's see which one would that be let me go back a little bit here under Terre Haute, way back at the beginning <laughs> and i'm curious because I'm from Knox County and ah. I've never heard of this. Was it Kramer Spring? No. Oh, it the was, Hancock County well? It, uh, Knox County would be, it, would, it, it looked like it was right along the Wabash River, south of Terre Haute. It was, it was back on your map. Oh, on my map. Okay, yes, I guess I could share that, couldn't I? I actually have Go back to my map. I actually have an online map. This one right here. Is that the one? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Wabash River would be on the far western side. Uh, oh, orange. Oh, that is the tree spring. The tree spring is a wonderful. It, actually, I think it was. Um, they attempted to put it on the historic register, but I don't think it was actually put on the historic register. But it is a spring that has a whole. Um, what they call origin narrative. Like it, it started because there were two landowners who were um, betting on something. I can't remember what they were betting on, but whoever won, one of them was going to open a liquor store. The other one was going to bring water to the, to the community and the water guy won. So he piped this artesian spring through a tree, through a sycamore tree. And so it was called the spring, tree spring for many years. But um, now it's it's no longer goes through a, a tree, but it's still there. Um, it's in Vermilion County. I think it's Vermilion County. Okay, so it's a little above where I thought it was, but okay. Okay, yeah, it's a, it's a very beautiful spot too. It's got a lovely farm, the tree tree, tree spring farm that is um, next to it. Yeah, I don't know if anyone has any questions about any. You can see there's a big cluster of them just north of Indianapolis, they were, most of those were there because they were drilling for gas and they hit artesian springs by, by accident. So there's quite a few artesian springs in that area around between Muncie, Anderson, and Indianapolis. So Kay, this is research that's ongoing for you? Yes, I'm still researching. I would love to do another oral history project, but they take a lot of research sources. Um, you know, this one took several years to complete. COVID did kind of stop us for a little bit, but uh, the interview part is really fun, but then the transcription part is like very slow usually and takes a lot of resources. So I would like to do another one. I'm just not sure um, if, how, how I would um, finance and find the time for it at the moment, but I'm also very interested in this spring, the God's Acre Healing Spring, which is in Blackville, South Carolina. I just made a trip down there. It's a spring that uh, is also has an origin story uh, that has to do with the Civil War, it goes way back. And um, it's considered to be a healing spring. Um, it's got a, a Baptist church that's uh, right next to it. And I'm just really fascinated by it. Yeah. Yeah. So that might be my next focus. So if you, so in the future, you would pick a different area. So you're. Well, I, yeah, there's so many interesting springs out there, but that one has always kind of been, I, I'm really, I, I'd like to explore more of this idea of spirituality and spring water. Mm. And so that's one that I think has a very clear link. And I think it would be a really interesting one to explore. Definitely. Yep. Yeah. So who knows? I mean, I've, there's also so many in Indiana that I would like to find out more about. The one in, in um, Richmond, I would love to do an oral history project on that one. Because um, it's, it, it's still in use. Mm. 
but who knows? <laughs> but I'm glad you guys are interested. I mean, I think they're pretty fascinating. And they're beautiful spaces too. A lot of times when I'm there, I, I just kind of soak in the environment, you know, and they're very calming. Yeah. I'd really like to visit one sometime now. Well, I hope you find one. The one in English is very sweet little spring. And if you ever get to Indianapolis, the Carmel one is, is a really nice spring to, to take a little hike in around it, you know, around it. This was actually the inspiration for the Gary Park. Um, they visited it and looked at how they, how they set it up. And one of the early inspirations to make a park for that, for that spot. So I'm gonna stop my share, is that okay at this point? I think so. Um, are there any other questions, Lisa? No, that was really fascinating. Gave me a lot to think about. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. We should go on a road trip sometime. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thanks yeah. a lot, Diane.